Manish, I'd like to start with you, if I could. Uh, now, before I was in Singapore, I spent years in Beijing covering technology founders. And what really struck me about them is how deeply buried they are in running their business, right? Uh, and to be fair, also in China, there are a lot of other things going on right now. So the idea of legacy or wealth planning just never comes up. Uh, how do you convince a very busy first-generation entrepreneur to diversify and think longer term? Very interesting question, David, and good morning, everyone. I think before we address the issue itself, we need to understand why that is happening, right? So if you take the modern history, uh, wealth creation happened in Asia uh, uh, recently, right, in the last 30, 40 years compared to Europe or US where, uh, you know, there are fifth, sixth generation families who are already uh, well established in terms of their processes. They have probably exited their legacy business and now uh, they are managing passive financial assets. Whereas in Asia, most of the wealth is still uh, held by uh, first generation entrepreneurs. Uh, to your point, David, most of them are tech entrepreneurs. Now we have uh, crypto and metaverse entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't know how many of them are billionaires still, but probably there are still <laughs> few few left there. Dollar is a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so we need to understand that you know, in Asia, it's a relatively new concept. And like with kids, if you tell them to do something, they may not do, but what they learn is from observation, right? What their other peers are doing, what, what, what the parents are doing. Similarly, what happens with this, these entrepreneurs is, no matter how much we talk to them, they will follow what, what the general trend is, right? So I think it's at, at a nascent stage. It will, it will uh, um, progress and, and it will mature uh, eventually. Uh, other big issue I see in Asia is uh, seeding control. We know many famous billionaires whose sons are, are like 60 year old, but still they have not handed over the reign uh, to their uh, kids or the next generation. The reason for that could be you know, a trust or the doubt on the capability of, of the next gen. Right now, keeping this as a background, how do we convince them? Like I was speaking to a tech billionaire who is 32 year old, mm -hmm. and he was like, Manish, what are you talking about succession planning? I have a two year old kid. I want to focus on my business, probably have two or three more innings left in me. I said, yes, that's right. But tomorrow if a bus runs over you or you know, your plane crashes, I mean, we don't pray for all that, but these, these things are real, real possibilities. Your wife doesn't understand anything about your technology business or anything. So it's, it's a very good risk mitigation tool that everybody needs to be mindful of. And even from their own business perspective, right? Business succession is equally important, as important as uh, family succession. So you have to balance that out. No, absolutely. Now, I do have to ask a difficult question of you. You, know, you made the point people do as they see and they learn from observation. Uh, given that we have two advocates of platforms with us today, I have to ask, you know, in the era of Wall Street bets, uh, you know, uh, Robin Hood, and we've got YouTube clips telling everyone how they should invest and things like that. Why should an entrepreneur spend the extra money uh, to go with a managed service provider rather than doing it themselves? That's for me, right? That's for you. Okay. <laughs> um, so technology is always an enabler, and it will always be, right? Uh, if, you, if you look at a lot of uh, developments that has happened in the last 30, 40 years in the space of technology, that has not happened in, in centuries, right? So it's, it's, it's fast tracking. We, we are reaching singularity probably by 40, uh, 2040. It's predicted that artificial intelligence becomes even more smarter than, than human beings, right? We are yet to see that, but we are, we are approaching there. So technology will always be enabler, but there are still very complicated issues which cannot be handled. Like there are a lot of data to suggest that uh, most investors lack the returns of benchmark indices. And why that is that, uh, there is because of the irrational investor behavior, right? Because they take certain calls which are wrong. Last year I was speaking to a lot of investors who were like, oh, we are superstars, we invest in technology, we don't need any advice. Now same guys are coming back and telling me, Manish, I'm, I'm in a fix, I don't know, I, I like over, over uh, did one particular asset class. Now how do I risk manage, right? How do I recover all that? So, so these things require a lot of uh, behavioral science and as they say, investing is more of art than science. So, so you have to balance it out in that sense, right? There's a place for technology for sure, but it has to be an enabler and it cannot be the, the whole thing in itself. No, oh, got it. Uh, Rachel, I want to turn to you and ask, you know, from an entrepreneur's perspective, you spent so much of your life uh, building up this business. Yeah. You know, what made you step back and think, 
I need to go beyond just what I'm doing day to day and I need to think of my longer term investment future. Yeah, so I started the business um, 17 years ago and this was before um, smartphones, before online shopping took off like it, like, like it is today now, right? So um, a couple of my friends and I came together because we wanted to sell our pre-loved clothes online for extra pocket money. So that was how it was. And after a while, we ran out of clothes to sell and we decided to, uh, with the money that we had saved back then, to import clothes to sell. And after a while of doing that, back then I was still in school, I was still in university. Um, I would go during weekends or school term breaks to Hong Kong, Bangkok to import clothes to sell. But I realized that, you know, um, there was always something missing from the pieces, be it the quality, the fit. No one was, no brand out there was really catering to the Asian women, right? A lot of international brands cater primarily to the American European women who have very different needs, body proportions, skin tone than us Asian women. So. Um, in my final year of university, this was in 2010, with no fashion, no business background, I decided to drop out of school to start the business proper, uh, to start creating our own pieces, our own collections and creating our own brand. Um, the tricky thing was because I was bonded to the government in university, so I had to um, pay off the government for a five-figure sum. Um, and I didn't have the money, and that was also when my... Uh, my dad's business uh, was hit by the financial crisis and he was going through bankruptcy. My mom was already working two jobs to support the family. And I didn't know who else to go to to borrow that sum of money, but I finally went to my mom. And I, it wasn't until a while later that I realized that the sum of money that I eventually borrowed from her to pay off the bond was actually her entire life savings then. So she took that leap of faith in me. And back then, I remember her asking me, you know, is this a legal business? Will the government come after you? Why are people transferring money before they receive their goods? You know, it's something that she couldn't wrap her head around. Um, so yeah, that was then, you know. Um, and since then, we have grown the business um, to what it is today, having 19 stores in 10 markets. Um, and to your question, right? Uh, I think, David, for us, being bootstrapped all the way in, over the last 12 years as well, um, I always thought to myself that, okay, investing is for when I'm wealthy. Investing is when I have a certain amount of money in my bank. It's not for me. And also growing up, I guess, right? I, I, having, um, I guess, parent, the way my parents were also really influenced the way I looked at money and investing and my parents have always been more savers than investors of their of their um of their wealth the little that they had so for me i think it wasn't until i had my son my my my, my son about 19 months ago that i decided that i need to really rethink how i think about money and wealth um carefully and that was when you know i met Honestly, uh, it was Surrender Peters, but I met Greg and, and Dawa's team. Uh, and that was really how it started for me. That was when I took it more seriously to start planning uh, for my long-term finances as well. So yeah, that was how it started. I wish I had started my financial wellness journey, personal financial wellness journey much earlier. Um, but to me, you know, being a woman, especially in this generation, no one really talks about it, right? And I think sometimes, even for me, being a business owner, I still find... Uh, that it can be quite intimidating when you talk about personal finance, uh, personal finances and of course investing. So I think this is something that I also hope uh, through my experience to be able to make investing a lot more accessible to the everyday person. Mm. Oh, certainly, I mean, given the state of index funds right now, well, I'm sure everyone wishes they started five years earlier into the bull run. Yes. Uh, now, and Dallas is all very well and good for getting you low cost access to, you know, sort of uh, funds that would normally be accessible to you, but I do have to ask, you know, a robot can't really help you plan your legacy or, or create a will or talk about succession yet. As you sort of go on your journey, given that now you're thinking about the next generation, et cetera, is that something you'd consider? Maybe going with, uh, you know, a multifamily office or an asset manager, someone who's capable of thinking of more of those services? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's really exposing myself a lot more, you know, to the different options and choices up, out there. And I think um, because I still have a pretty long runway in my uh, career journey, so I think for me, it's important. I should have started yesterday. So I think it's for me to also understand, you know, the risk appetite that I have, what's the runway that I have, and then, you know, try to diversify as much as possible. I am still... 
well, embarrassingly, just very early on in this journey. So I think for me to hang out more with people like Sam and Manisha to get to know, uh, to familiarize myself a lot more in this area uh, would be very important for me. Hang out with Sam. That's the life <laughs> lesson here. Sam, uh, with inflation on the rise, a lot of younger professionals are increasingly cost sensitive. They're worried about their salaries and their ability to fund retirements and families. Is this a factor you think will drive first generation users, especially uh, onto your platform, platforms like it? Thank you, David. Um, I think it's not just cost, cost consciousness is not just a young person's issue. I think it's an issue for all of us, especially in this environment of very high inflation, persistently high inflation. Um, I think that, you know, if I touch upon what Rachel said as first gen, you know, entrepreneurs, uh, I was a professional investor all my life, but um, even I just don't have time um, to invest uh, properly. Um, and so investing is a full-time job, uh, and there's professionals who do that well. And so one of the reasons why we built Endowas was because for me, um, you know, and for Greg, and for many people, uh, investing is just painful, um, and it's very costly um, traditionally as well. So um, as a digital platform, um, any offline to online conversion, and this is true not just for wealth or Endowas, but for any digital, uh, sorry, any offline to online conversion like Amazon or Netflix, uh, if you really boil it down, really it's about two things. One is enhancing the user experience, and the other one is cost. And especially when it comes to investing and building wealth, cost is your biggest enemy, right? Why would you wanna shave off one, two percent of your performance every single year and give it to you know, somebody who's not adding value? So I think the digital platform, um, as we move to the next generation, and we've had you know, family office members come in, but the next generation is growing up with, you know, Rachel and I are familiar with mobile apps. That's where we do our financial transactions. And I think it's taken time um, in the wealth space where digitization has been very slow. Uh, but I think the COVID um, crisis has actually rapidly accelerated digital adoption in the wealth space. And so I think the next generation is going to demand a better experience and demand a much more fair and transparent cost. Mm. My issue with you is that you're, uh, that he just looks too photogenic. I always feel like he's trying to sell me fashion products rather than investment products. But, I should uh, join Rachel and Rachel. That's right. No, you're, you're all too attractive. Now, uh, I, I have to ask you a hard question as well. Uh, I am subscribed to your newsletters as I am to many mm -hmm. other newsletters from financial organizations and investors. And I did note a May example uh, was very prescient, talking about inflation, how big of an issue it was, and yep. uh, offered some, some examples of inflation-linked uh, bonds and funds and that sort of nature, and inflation-resilient funds mm. that would be uh, useful in that environment. And the beauty of the Bloomberg terminal is I can plug their early eyes in and see how they've performed since May. And I have to say, in some cases, the answer is not very well. Uh, Given that, uh, okay, let's take, if I'm a first generation wealth creator, right, uh, I'm facing an increasingly volatile market. Uh, my expertise is in you know, networking with provincial officials and giving them multi, rather than uh, actually looking at US Treasury bond yields, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't now actually the time to go hyper-personalized uh, with services like those offered by Maitri and other investment managers? It, it, absolutely. I think um, investing is a deeply personal experience. Um, everybody's at a different stage in life. Everybody has different goals in life, uh, different amounts of money, different risk appetite. So I think the individual will have to really, and, and this is why we, we say that we're not just a financial service company, but we're a content company and we're so missional about financial education and improving financial literacy because it is in the hands of the individual to make that decision, to assess who we are, what am I, you know, what is my risk appetite? What am I comfortable with? What is my goals in life? What am I, you know, using this money for? Because as entrepreneurs, I think, you know, Rachel and I didn't start the business just to make money. We did it because we wanted to solve a pain point and, you know, provide a solution for others. Um, and, you know, when you're bogged down in the day-to-day -day business, then it's very difficult, to, as you said, to focus on, you know, the latest inflation or the latest, you know, market ticker, um, however great Bloomberg's um, you know, terminals are, and I've been, I'm a 28 year user of Bloomberg terminal, so um, <laughs> love it. Uh, quick plug for Bloomberg. <laughs> um, but basically, I think that, you know, um, 
uh, when you're looking at looking out in the market, one of the most important things to understand is that not everybody's a professional. And as individuals, you look at the stats. SMP, SMP publishes a quarterly report on active managers and how many outperform. The first quarter was 80% underperformed. The second quarter results came out 96% underperformed global market indices. 96% underperformed. And so, yes, we have the great Jim Rogers in, mm. in the house, and so I'm not going to say it's impossible to generate alpha. When I was a professional investor, I generated alpha for multiple years mm. as an investor. So it is possible, but it's difficult to do it sustainably and consistently and generate enough alpha. So we're in an environment this year where 96%, 96% of active investors are underperformed. And if you're a passive investor and you're building wealth in the long, over the long term, like Rachel, you think that it's late, but actually this downturn is probably an amazing opportunity mm -hmm. to start investing regular savings and build wealth because for the vast majority of the population, that is the right way to do it. That's what Warren Buffett thinks, and that's uh, the strategy that we espouse. And just going quickly on the point of robots, and that's why I hate the word robo-advisor. Mm. It's a misnomer. There's no robot in the, in the, in the office trying to beat the market. Uh, there's no robo, and they often don't give advice. They just buy, build a product, a fund, like a hedge fund or an actively managed fund. And invariably, over time, they underperform. Mm. So we like to call ourselves a digital wealth platform where we're providing a service like Amazon and Netflix does. The real takeaway I got you is that we should all give money to Jim Rogers. I, uh, you know, that sounds like a plan that we can all get behind given that he's speaking. So I, I, if I can close by asking you, Rachel, you know, a somewhat difficult question. Right now we're facing so many macroeconomic headwinds. How difficult is it, frankly, you know, when there are so many issues facing all businesses, including yours, to think about these sort of these bigger picture issues, right? The sort of the legacy issues, the, the what you leave behind. And do you actually still think about, you know, what you'll leave behind on the world once you're gone? Or is it all about how the heck do I get my products off the shelves? <laughs> yeah, I think at this stage of my life, I think being a mom also and taking care of so many people in the business, I think it's also more than just for myself. And, and I totally agree with what Sam said. I think it's also... Um, really making use of the market that they're in now, the situation that we're in now to make um, bolder moves also. And I think this also applies both to the business and to our personal lives as well. So yeah, I think that's something that would be important for me personally and as a professional as well. Second baby coming? <laughs> Second baby coming, we'll see. <laughs> well, look, uh, thank you so much. Oh, we do have one very quick uh, Question from the audience. Are digital platforms for mass and mass affluent investors consistent with using active managers and providing newsletters with investment opinion? Um, yeah, I'll try to unwrap that question a little bit. It's uh, putting in a lot of different things. Uh, first of all, I think digital platforms, obviously, um, in its early adoption, is for mass and mass affluent. But, but I'm a believer that we can actually digitize high net worth services. I mean, Dallas has is have grand ambitions to build high net worth, ultra high net worth solutions, uh, private market solutions and platforms as well. So we're not just for the mass and mass affluent. We want to be a total wealth platform that serves you throughout your investment journey for your investment life, um, especially if you build wealth and become a high net worth and ultra high net worth individual. Uh, so that's, I, I think digital is something, I mean, the future is digital. So we have to adopt digital, uh, digital solutions for the high net worth and private banks and many other guys is doing that as well. Um, the education piece is, is, is just something that we just have to continue to do and push on because I think it's critical to the success of not only individuals and families, but society and nations. Um, you know, we just aren't educated well enough in terms of financial things. You know, even when I was a professional investor, I would run my professional money, tens of billions, in an institutional way, but then I would punt stocks and buy my, you know, invest in my friend's company without doing any due diligence with my private money. Mm -hmm. So as, even as a professional investor, I'm not managing my uh, investments properly. And when you invest, there is a right way of doing things. You know, things like, you know, diversification. 90% returns actually are generated by asset allocation because the asset class you know, is what drives return. So all these basics, we do need to, you know, um, give individuals and empower them uh, to make, do it in the right way and, and make the right type of investment. How That's did right your PA that. go? I mean, given that you're still working and not retired on the yacht, 
I was, I was told to do this me and my money session where I opened myself up to my worst investments. Um, so it's there, $100,000 put into my friend's company, mm. a fingerprint technology company uh, that went to zero. That was my worst investment. But uh, in the financial markets, I've actually done much better. <laughs> I hope so. On that Be careful note, of private markets. That's the <laughs> well, apparently the poll says everyone should listen to financial media, which is what happens when we stack half the room with journalists. But thank you, everyone. Please give them a warm round of applause. You've been fantastic.